Hi, all. I'm Bethany Beavis from um, CRE Tech. Um, at CRE Tech, we love to introduce kind of the newest um, in tech uh, in the commercial real estate space. And I think that's exactly what we've got today. Um, we've got Abundant Power. I'm going to turn it right over to the gentleman over at Abundant Power. Um, Shannon Smith, their CEO, will get us started. Thanks, I Bethany. Yep. You can see me now. So, hey, we're uh, glad to be hosting this um, webinar with our friends at Cretech. I want to welcome all those who are listening. Um, we are just on the other end of Hurricane Michael down here. I don't think we're going to have any uh, connectivity issues, but it's a pretty web day in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we're located. Um, I want to just give you a brief word about uh, who we are uh, as, a, as a company and uh, set the table for why it's time for facility management and building management in general to go beyond energy analytics. Uh, first, I just will let us know who's going to be on the, the webinar today. Um, we'll have our chief engineer, uh, Derek McGarry, and uh, one of our um, good partners, um, Patrick Stark, who is Vice President and Director of Energy and Sustainability for Lincoln Harris, which is the Southeastern uh, Partnership of Lincoln Properties. So I'll tell you a little bit about Abundant Power. Um, Abundant Power was started in uh, 2009. Uh, we were specifically uh, set up to make an impact on the built environment. Uh, we started initially in uh, the capital uh, creation business for building retrofits and have a sister company, Clean Source Capital, which is one of the nation's leaders in innovative forms of capital for uh, building owners who are seeking to make significant retrofits to their buildings. But early on in that, um, in that process, we began to see a real lack of business case data, uh, transparency um, in the built environment into how these buildings are actually operating. There's a lot of uh, static information, nameplate information, and people were hesitant to, to spend real money uh, to improve their buildings. So about four or five years ago, we began toying around with and experimenting with software and services that could be used to help building owners um, uh, see better into their buildings, manage their building, buildings better, and then make uh, informed capital decisions to improve them. So we began this business and where we are today, and you can see on the left side of your screen, a question mark, because we'll be rebranding uh, Abundant Power and all this activity. Um, moving Abundant Power to a holding company uh, this coming uh, November at the New York uh, City PropTech Week. And so that name will, will be coming out in the next uh, couple of weeks. But I think we are at a real interesting moment in uh, facility management. Uh, as it's been discussed, there's a significant talent gap uh, today for facility managers and property managers who, who rely on FMs to, to keep their buildings going. I think the Rivix study that came out with IFMA said that there are more people over the age of 70 today than under the age of 30 in facility management. Uh, that's created a, li a limited time scarcity, uh, as well as the increase in technology has created somewhat a talent scarcity. Uh, we're seeing a lot of changing workforce dynamics uh, that are, are shaping different ways that buildings are gonna be used. And we're also at an interesting place um, in the cycle today, uh, creating uh, maybe some uncertainty about where this market will be going in the future. And lastly, uh, one of the old bul bulwarks of how you're doing in your building, Energy Star, and we'll talk about this more later, was recalibrated back in August. So maybe how you're doing isn't exactly how you're doing anymore. And I think the last piece I'd say is there's, a, there's been an overwhelming amount of, of analytics and uh, messaging in the market. Uh, particularly from energy analytics companies and, and new technology choices has created a fair amount of confusion in the marketplace today. And the first and second wave of energy analytic movers have, have brought much to the table, but our contention is uh, at Abundant that the purpose of a building is not to save energy. We don't build buildings and create these wonderful structures in our major cities uh, for the purpose of saving energy. We, we build buildings because to provide a, 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 an attractive workplace experience for their occupants and to last as long as they can for the lowest operating and capital cost. So we think it's time to go beyond energy analytics. It's time for the built environment to move beyond energy analytics. We decided, um, we decided that the best place to start is uh, focusing in on what is available in, in the building management system or the JSO building. We think it's time to weaponize that information 
in a way that can really um, speak to things that drive the value of a business and drive the mission of a business better than just what the energy analytics will tell you. We also recognize in a recent survey that I read that over 50% of the respondents of a, a number of uh, large real estate companies with uh, facility management capabilities said they're having challenges in, in both user adoption of technology, the staff expertise to even manage their buildings, the staff expertise to extract data, and then the staff expertise to analyze that data. So whatever that platform is, has some real challenges ahead. And that's, the, that's what we try to address in our technology at Abundant. So before I turn it over to Derek, I'll say that the parameters of which we have designed our software have been uh, around the following principles. First is to maximize time. It has to be intuitive and easy. Two, it has to be able to solve the talent gap. Three, it needs to remain with your building and to be a stable source of information for performance as teams and owners are switched back and forth. Five is to eliminate comfort mistakes, which is the one thing you think you can control in building performance and you don't. It has to focus on cost savings to extend asset life. And finally, and the most important thing that I think sets the next level of uh, analytics uh, to go beyond what energy analytics does is it has to be actionable, provide precise intelligence to those who are using it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, our, our friends uh, at Lincoln Harris and Derek to discuss exactly how our technology works and then uh, from Patrick Starr's perspective, how it actually can be used to solve real problems. Okay. Thanks, Shannon. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is Derek McGarry. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by background and have uh, been working with Abundant for nine years now. Um, it's been quite quite an evolution, and um, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about is how uh, technology is enabling us to go beyond energy. So, just starting here with uh, Energy Star, you know the, the the general traditional approach to managing buildings, besides putting out fires, is to look at energy. And so, energy data. Every building has a monthly utility bill. With that data alone, we can get Energy Star scores. It's a great program the federal government has put in place for, I think, decades now. Um, as Shannon mentioned, the scoring curve, if you will, grading on a curve changed recently, and, and typical office buildings uh, saw their scores drop by about 12 points. The good news there is that that implies that the building stock in, in America has improved by 12 points, uh, perhaps. So that's good news, we're going in the right direction. But with the advent of technology, now we can go further. And so to kind of highlight the, 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 the point or the opportunity, uh, we like to use this visual here, energy analytics. So what do we mean by that? Uh, again, every building has a monthly utility bill. Um, some basic pieces of information you can get on that over time. It tells you a bit about how the building uh, performs, how it compares to other buildings. Uh, if you want to get richer data, um, add real-time metering. Uh, perhaps your utility company allows you to tap into interval data, you know, every five minutes, how much uh, KW is, is the building drawing. Um, that helps uh, even further to identify uh, leaders and laggards in terms of uh, what types of, of uh, what time energy is being used more rather than less. Um, you can go even deeper with an energy analytics and go to submetering or go to even deeper than submetering circuit level metering. And that's something you know we have lots of interest in and, and we've deployed that and seen owners deploy those types of, of meter solutions. But uh, there's another resource that we want to tap into, and that is BMS data. So it's fairly normal for Class A buildings to have a building management system, building automation system, whatever you want to call it. It's an HVAC control system. And the volume of data we can get off of an HVAC control system is night and day compared to what you get from energy. And it opens up uh, uh, an equatable, bigger opportunity to, to add value. And so when we talk about 
going beyond energy. Um, the first thing is, is, is let's just, you know, talk a little bit more about the value of energy. We're talking about, you know, on average, say $1.65 a square foot a year for office buildings. Um, you know, and, and there's other similar metrics for other types of buildings. Well, saving 20% could be 30, 40, 50 cents a square foot, uh, depending on how bad uh, performing the building is or what type of use it is and what the rates are in whatever, um, whatever part of the country you are or world for that matter. Um, and that's fantastic. People love to see operating costs re reduce. Uh, but there's a bigger order of value that we can look at when we go into BMS data analytics, and that is equipment health. Uh, we call it asset health. Uh, but what we're talking about, uh, you know, for the most part, is HVAC equipment. When we can watch the performance of HVAC equipment 24-7, 365, uh, see temperatures, flows, pressures, all this type of scientific data enables a much greater opportunity for value. If we can, uh, well, let's put it this way. We discovered that essentially the value of, of, of going from an, a piece of equipment that's in occupied mode 24 seven to a more typical office occupied period, um, that's worth roughly 50 cents a square foot a year in CapEx cost. Uh, so think about a typical air-cooled rooftop package HVAC unit on, on a roof. It has a common life of, of 15 years. Well, that's, that's on average. If you run it 24 seven, uh, that could be driven down to eight, nine, 10 years. Um, if you drive it really, really efficiently and, and, and reduce its runtime and take care of it um, with good preventative maintenance, uh, that piece of equipment could last 18, 19, 20 years, even, even longer. That is money. That is more money than energy savings. So that's what BMS analytics allows us to go. But there's one more level of, uh, of opportunity, and that is comfort. Uh, like Shannon talked about, buildings have a purpose, and that purpose is not to save energy. We all like saving energy, but the real purpose is for the people in the building so that they're productive and happy. Uh, for an owner of multi-tenant buildings, that's that's a, an opportunity to uh, improve lease uh, renewals. Uh, that's real money, and that's what drives buildings. And so performance analytics, using data from a BMS or lots of other sensors, which are inside of a BMS, um, enables us to track mechanical comfort. Now, when we talk about comfort, um, as you see on this, on this graphic, um, through analytics, right now we are talking about mechanical comfort. So this is not addressing whether you have a, um, a thermostat in every private office or a shared thermostat across 10 private offices. This is how well are the mechanical systems delivering what they're being asked to deliver at the thermostat. Now, that's a big deal though. 65% um, of all work orders in commercial buildings are associated with hot and cold calls. And anecdotally, um, we found that our clients that focus on comfort first, mechanical comfort, using analytics, they find that these hot cold calls are, are roughly cut in half. That's addressing mechanical problems. If we can nail all the mechanical problems, cut comfort complaints in half, that's reducing the workload on the property managers, on the facility managers, and it's also reducing the angst for the tenants, either colleagues of yours in your buildings or uh, rent paying tenants that are paying 30, you know, 40 bucks a square foot a year. So let's uh, 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 just want to show this as a little bit more detail on, on comfort and what we can do with comfort. So um, uh, the metric uh, that we use, uh, and, and there's lots of variations of this, is, is a three degree offset. So if any any zone, comfort zone in a building is more than three degrees outside of set point. During occupied hours, it hurts the score on the left side of the screen. 
Uh, we can go deeper than that. We can look at a two degree band. We can look at a one degree band and we can tell you exactly which zones are having these, uh, these, these worse comfort scores, mechanical comfort scores. That makes it really easy to solve issues proactively before a tenant complains about it. Or perhaps uh, as we've seen a lot of, as tenants will complain once, maybe twice, and they'll forget about it. Whether you've resolved it or not, uh, they're just gonna stop complaining. That doesn't mean they're happy, and that doesn't mean that it's gonna result in a lease renewal. So it's really important to not ignore what the data can tell us, which is pretty easy things. It's any building could be 100% comfort at the thermostat if the mechanical systems are working properly. And interestingly, we found, it surprised us, it surprised uh, buildings we've connected to, but uh, typical existing buildings that have not been commissioned recently or ever, um, are, have comfort scores building-wide running in the 80s. And um, our clients that have been driving action through comfort analytics are finding that they can maintain close to 100% at this three degree level. And that means something. That means something to a lot of people. So I'm gonna ch change gears a little bit here and talk about the reality of the market. So analytics is, 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 is as easy as we want to make it. And, and we think we've done a great job of making it easy. It's, it's pretty complicated. Uh, uh, what's behind the scenes and sometimes what people have to deal with. And so we've created this diagram to help articulate the entire market and the entire issue of deploying analytics for value. So what we have is the food for analytics is data. So the best data is sensor level data, zone level data, component level data, you know, equipment level data. Traditionally, that comes from a BMS uh, uh, system, a control system. So we tap into that, we have a rich source of data. Now we don't wanna forget that there is other data, build data, submeter data, circuit level data. Um, that is still food for analytics, uh, but it starts to become dwarfed by BMS data in terms of what it can tell you, specific actionable insights. Um, and then energy data becomes a way to validate uh, the energy savings from focusing on comfort first, then asset health. And I'll, I'll just mention, um, I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but we found that our clients typically want to focus on comfort first, then asset health, and energy savings falls along. Uh, on average, using BMS analytics, monitoring based commissioning is another term to describe this type of service. 20% uh, consumption savings is what's achieved. And again, by focusing on comfort first. Uh, but ultimately, what we want to have happen with BMS analytics is action. So how do we get there? Uh, fundamental uh, to save time, uh, as opposed to just simply looking at a uh, control system screen and seeing a single snapshot in time, or having to dig through trend logs that are a little bit unwieldy. Uh, not many folks uh, look at trend data anymore these days. I don't have time for it. FMs don't have, facility managers don't have time. So fault detection, FDD uh, stands for fault detection and diagnostics. Some people will say AFDD for automated fault detection and diagnostics. Uh, whatever term you use for this, what we're referring to is a software that connects to a, a, a data source, typically a, a control system, organizes all of that data using, uh, there's a haystack tagging methodology that makes things very universally friendly for how to extract value from the data. Um, but then, then these platforms run rules against the data looking for faults. So these rules are, are, are uh, the, the most common examples are, imagine looking at a, uh, you get a hot cold call, uh, so an FM facility manager gets a hot cold call, they say, okay, which, which piece of equipment is serving that tenant? So they go to the control system, they look at a snapshot in time and say, you know, okay, it says the damper is open, but it says the airflow is zero. Well, that's a fault. Um, what if the damper was open at 100% and the airflow was 100 CFM? Well, just looking at a snapshot doesn't tell us whether that's a fault. 
but if we saw that um, uh, something over time was happening, uh, we provided a lot more color. So fault detection and diagnostics runs rules 24-7, 365 against every piece of equipment in a building. And that enables to see a time aspect of, of, of faults. So you can say, well, I've got 10 boxes that are having uh, airflow issues, but these three boxes uh, are having airflow issues the most. And so I'm gonna prioritize those three for my technician or my third party mechanical contractor to go resolve. Um, but the reality of where analytics is today is somebody has to look at these faults. Somebody has to look at the FDD platform to come up with a recommended action to create value. We call that curation. And that requires, uh, uh, right now, unfortunately, this isn't, um, I don't know of any platform that's very user-friendly in a practical sense uh, from a smartphone. We're getting there. Uh, other, other competitors of ours are, are getting there. We're all working on it. But at this point, analytics is, is, a, is a pretty high level type of, of expertise required to digest faults. We can, I could pull up a building right now, a uh, class A office tower um, in Alabama and see over a thousand faults over, a, over the last few weeks. That is way too much information to take action with. So somebody has to go through those and prioritize them and come up with an action. So there are tools that makes this easier and we put a lot of effort into making these tools and we call it nothing fancy, post-processing is how can we make it easier for a mechanical engineer, certified energy manager, somebody that has time to sit at a desk and be strategic and proactive for a portfolio of buildings uh, we put post-processing tools in their hands to make it easier for them to curate what really matters for their building or their clients. Um, and technology, the nature of it is that um, uh, us and, uh, and, and many of our, our colleagues who have uh, platforms as well are improving the post-processing. So this is, we're not at the finish line. And this will be a continuous evolution where you know, we're starting to feather in artificial intelligence proper artificial intelligence, not just misusing that term, but uh, also machine learning to help the curation process even further. And there's a lot more room to go. Um, so uh, there's one more thing I can't forget about, and that is workflow management. It's great to find issues, but how does that translate into a work order? Effectively, somebody needs to get a direction. What, where should we turn a wrench? Where should I send a technician? Where should uh, my mechanical contractor go? Or um, can a controls uh, technician log on remotely and fix something without even going to the site? Analytics helps us do that. Workflow management is important. Being able to create an action item electronically right from the data. Uh, and we put a lot of effort into making that happen. But we'd like to use this chart to show kind of what's required to get value out of analytics. And there's lots of different flavors out there. So a um, couple more concepts I wanna share. And this is really the high level, easiest way to show how post-processing simplifies value from analytics. What we're seeing right here is a scatter plot of um, every dot is a piece of equipment in a building. And every piece of equipment through analytics can have a comfort score and an asset health score. So plot those on a chart, um, you know, zero, zero down in the bottom left, 100, 100 up on the top right. And what we wanna see is all those dots moving to the top right. So someone who's using an analytics platform like ours can look at one of the dots in the lowest left, and perhaps that's the priority to focus on. Click on that dot, learn some information about that piece of equipment, turn it into a work order, resolve it, and we're moving in the direction like this. And um, one of, um, I think, let 
Yeah, this is, uh, this is the last graphic I want to show before I um, uh, introduce uh, Patrick Stark. Um, but this is really what his buildings look like once they, he's been um, deploying uh, our platform against it. Is it's really simple to imagine how you can gain value for your clients or your owner or your buildings, however you want to characterize who the, who the winners are, or for tenants for that matter, uh, making them comfortable is move everything into the top right. So we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna turn this a little bit, Patrick. Uh, so we're gonna have a, a, a bit of a, of a discussion and, and, and for the next um, uh, 15 minutes here uh, before we open it up to Q and A. Um, and um, I, want, um, uh, I want Patrick, I want you to you know, introduce yourself. I'll just say real quickly that Lincoln Harris is a, is a partner of ours that has been using our platform uh, uh, for creating high performance in some of their buildings. And uh, Patrick um, uh, has a pretty interesting story about how they've gotten to this point and some, you know, probably some bruises along the way, uh, I'd imagine. So uh, uh, Patrick, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about Lincoln Harris. Yep. I'm Patrick Stark. Uh, I am Vice President, Director of Energy and Sustainability at Lincoln Harris. Um, Lincoln Harris is a commercial real estate uh, company. Uh, we are the corporate service division of Lincoln Property Company, a uh, parent company uh, and partner. And um, Lincoln Harris, we do property management um, development and uh, brokerage services for, for commercial real estate. We've got over 100 million square feet of real estate across the country. Um, I lead our energy and sustainability group. Um, so what we do, you know, we go in, we do Energy Star certifications, we do ASHRAE energy audits, uh, we manage energy projects, uh, commissioning services, and now we're doing um, continuous commissioning services with data analytics. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, kind of what we do. We, we, we do this, we have our own clients, uh, but we're always looking to, to reach out, especially with, with the energy, um, with our energy group, reaching out to other, to other groups that, that maybe don't have the expertise on board and, uh, we're willing to work with anybody and, and, and try and help make buildings better. Thanks, Patrick. You know, one of the things I think is really interesting about Lincoln Harris that uh, is what, what makes it fun to work with you guys and see how you deploy analytics is, is, is the bulk of, of that 100 million square feet is owned by somebody else. Correct. But a good chunk of it is developed and owned at least for some period of time by Lincoln Harris or your parent company, um, Lincoln Properties. Correct. And it's interesting that you guys strategically decided to deploy it first on your own properties. Correct. You know, build the case. Tell us a little bit about this pathway and how this is strategic to you. Yeah, so, um, you know, a few things. We, we got into data analytics uh, years ago um, with some of our other clients. Um, back then, data analytics was not what it is today. We were pulling BAS data. Um, sending it off to a company to run fault detection on it, and then they would send us back reports and action items. These people had no idea what our buildings were. Um, it was just all data that was being sent off and coming back, and it just didn't work well. Um, we, we, we tried moving kind of in, in, in some other directions and, and working with some other groups to, to get a more custom fit. Um, that didn't work out too well for us as they had their own agenda um, and, and it just didn't really fit when we needed customization, when we needed to kind of go in and, and make it fit what, what we needed the system to do. They weren't willing to do that and we kind of just got away from it for a little while. Um, and then we, we met with Abundant Power and a uh, very similar kind of background. First was real hesitant on it just because of kind of what we had been through in the past. Um, but started getting into it, really started creating that partnership and, and figuring out that they've got a really good solution that, that we can tap into and that they're willing to 
to work with us and, and make it work for our company. So um, having kind of been burned in the past uh, with some other clients, uh, we had just uh, done some development of our own. So we had our own buildings and we decided we would, we would try this solution again uh, with abundant power, but we were gonna do it in our own facilities. Um, so we brought it in um, to a, a new construction facility that had been operating for about a year. Um, it was 40% occupied at the time we brought it in. Um, and uh, we wanted to bring it in and, and kind of help us with warranty issues that we were having. A brand new building. Yeah, go ahead and pull up the graphic for that. Yeah, so, so brand new building, uh, but, but wanted to bring it in and, and make sure that the equipment was operating as it was supposed to be operating. And, um, and, and really just kind of test it all out. So uh, that's what we did. And, um, and it turned out we, we got some really good, good information out of it and, and we're able to make huge strides um, at that building. That building's Capitol Towers in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so that's, that's what we, uh, that's, you know, before we really started pushing it out to, to, to more of our clients, we wanted to do it ourselves. And, uh, and make sure that it was something that was, was gonna be worth it. Um, and it was. So, like I said, we put it into a, a, a new building. Um, and after we put it in, our occupancy has doubled. So we're up to 90, 100% occupancy right now. And our energy use has actually gone down. Um, so can't really tell you how much energy we have saved by doing analytics, but we haven't gained any energy and we filled up the building. So it's, it's definitely making um, huge differences. Yeah, I know. I love uh, the Capitol Tower story, Patrick. One of them, there's a couple of anecdotes, but uh, one of them uh, was my favorite. And I heard uh, the head property manager of Capitol Tower um, uh, was, was actually a, a little bit irritated because um, uh, energy metrics were so low, yep. it messed up his numbers. It did. So it caused a lot of. We messed up the base year. So we had our base year, and then we actually we reduced energy below the base year in our, in our second year. And um, it, uh, it, it made them a little bit irritated because we, you know, we were, we were messing with, with kind of what the standard really is. But then, you know, then again, we're saving energy, we're saving energy for our clients. And um, it's still, it's a, it's a great story to tell. Okay. Now tell us a little bit about um, uh, how, how comfort factors in. Yeah, so. That was kind of a new yeah, concept um, about using. Yeah, and so, you know, going back to, to, to original kind of analytics and looking at BAS trend data, um, a, a lot of the engineers didn't like us coming in, you know, years ago and, and doing analytics because we would want to come in to save energy. Um, that was kind of the main goal. And they would end up getting hot coals, hot calls, cold calls, um, because we would, you know, in their mind, we would be changing the system that they had kind of manipulated to prevent, to, to create a comfort level in the building. And uh, we're changing that to save energy. And it's, it's messing up kind of what they're doing. Um, but then there was no real way to really see kind of what, what the effects of the changes that we made were. So now with, with, with this system, using, using the analytics and the post-processing, um, we easily see, you know, we go in there, we see where, where heat's running, where it shouldn't be running in the middle of the summertime. Uh, we see where boxes are not being able to maintain um, their flow set point that they're at. We see zones that are not able to maintain the, the thermostat set point that they're calling for. So it's, it's more than just energy. And, uh, and we've seen um, quite a bit from this is, you know, increasing that, that comfort level while decreasing energy. Um, so we're able to go into the system and find where two zones side by side are fighting each other um, and, and correct the issue. So, you know, with, with, with BAS data, trend data, you might be able to find where the heat's running, um, but you might not really understand why the heat's running. 
um, or you might see that a pump is running and you might not know why the pump is running, just that it's running and that's causing a problem. Now with the data analytics, we can look at all these data points kind of together and really start problem solving and, and figuring out why things are doing what they're doing. Um, so then you, you, you sit there and you continue to drive, you, you create more efficient equipment with with how you're operating you create better operation of the building you create better comfort because you know you're able to go in and and see the the places that are not comfortable the places where thermostats are not being met where flow rates are not being met um, places that heat is running all the time because it's too cold in there we found areas where a VAV box uh, the minimum set point of the VAV box is too high so we're overcooling the space and then another VAV box is trying to, trying to reheat that space. Um, so it all kind of ties in together. And of course you run and reheat, you're reducing the life of your equipment, we're cycling fans, cycling heat, um, and, and it all just kind of flows together where you've got asset health, the comfort score and energy safety. Heck yeah, heck yeah. Well, um, that, that reminds me of uh, one, one other topic I think is, is good to cover before we open it up for questions is, um, you guys gave us pretty strong challenge um, when we started with you with analytics. Um, uh, we knew the history and that, that you know, there have been some kind of fits and starts and some disappointments uh, with, with analytics. And, and, and here's a building that is, is funded uh, mostly by Goldman Sachs, uh, I believe. And I mean, this is a big deal for, for, for Lincoln Harris. It's a, it's a major investment. Uh, Lincoln Harris put money into it. And um, uh, so they had their best, you know, property management team, their best facility engineers. Uh, Patrick, who's, who's, who's a centralized resource, um, uh, did commissioning on it, um, lead documentation, lead, uh, lead, lead efforts around that. Um, but what, was, what was, was really interesting was the dynamics with the chief engineer for the building. Um, this is a guy who's a, a veteran, um, you know, as Shannon mentioned, there's, there's more facility managers over the age of 70 than under the age of 30. This guy's not over 70, but, but, is, but he was, he's, he's a veteran. And um, like a lot of facility managers we've interacted with, um, analytics can be a bit threatening. And, um, and, and I remember his eyebrows went down when we called out a, a analytics, I shouldn't say we, analytics pointed out that a, a zone on the top floor serving, you know, pre, primo tenant uh, had a bad comfort score and he took it personally. Now that was, that's a fantastic attitude to have that he cares so much about his building. But, 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 it, but it brings, this guy was not at the building very long because you guys moved him on to your next big building. And um, he solves building problems. And now tell us first what, 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 how you saw his reaction grow and then why you guys are centralizing uh, analytics. So, yeah, so, you know, the, the guy in there, he, you know, his big thing was he's going to go in there, he's going to find these problems. He'll, he'll dive through the BAS, he'll dive through uh, the data, and he's going to find these issues and he's going to make his build. Um, and he's really good at that. He's, he's not the norm of building operations. He very he cares a lot. He goes home and pulls up the BAS and looks at it after hours. Um, and to him, you know, we're, we're doing all this and, and we're not going to, we're not going to find, you know, the, the savings. It's, it's just going to be more work for him to look through this. Um, and, and what's the benefit? So he got, I told him, Hey, you know, I know you're, and also, he's in a brand new building. We just went through commissioning. Um, the building is not, you know, one of these buildings that's been around and tweaked. I mean, this building is, is up to date. It's brand new. Everything should be running as it is, as it should be. And for the most part, lots of the equipment was running as it should, uh, should have and as it was designed. Um, the equipment interacting with each other kind of caused issues. So while the VAV boxes were all doing what they were supposed to be doing and designed. 
you know, we, we allow some, some temperature set points and one, one would be driving cooling, one would be driving heating. And so you would have, you would have issues with, with heating and cooling. Um, we had issues where uh, set points would cause problems, would cause equipment to run after hours or run at 100% when it shouldn't be running at 100%. Um, so as we started finding some more of these things, he started really getting interested and uh, he, he really likes the saying, you know, we, we watch you as you sleep, um, which is a little creepy, but, um, but it's true. So, I mean, I mean this, the, the abundant power, the, the data analytics is watching the system 24-7. The post-processing goes through and kind of does the first initial uh, run on, on rules and what should be happening and what shouldn't. And it comes in and it shows us, hey, your pumps ran all night or your cooling tower is going to 100%. In the middle of the night, and we don't know why. Um, and uh, these are the things that you don't see, you know, working at the building. Uh, we started doing uh, continuing development on the site, and his time got taken away from from his building and really looking at construction and stuff. So as as he lost the ability to go in and and spend all of his time at, at the one facility, because he's focused on a new facility we're able to sit there and make sure that the building is still running as it should and keeping it in line. Um, and we continue to find things. And it's not someone at the building walking through the building seeing these things. You know, it's my group sitting in a centralized location and we're pulling up the data and then, you know, having the conversations with the site team saying, here are the different things that we found. And then it's, you know, oh, wow, this is, this is good. This is really good. Um, so like you said, he's moved on to, a, to another property. And the first thing he said was, I want to bring data analytics with me because this has been huge. Um, it, it gives you another person um, really at the site, another highly skilled um, employee without actually having an employee to do that. Um, and like you said, uh, the talent is kind of dwindling and changing. Um, we're getting more into to data analytics as opposed to just walking around and, and kind of finding things. Um, there's not as many talented people out there. So it's hard to find chief engineers and, and assistant chief engineers and, and good operating engineers to bring into a property. Um, so having this solution, you know, we're able to kind of make up for that a little bit with data analytics and you don't necessarily need the best guy at a site anymore, multiple really good guys at a site anymore, um, because you have kind of that centralized resource that can really provide a lot of a lot of benefit. Heck yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, we're gonna. I mean, Patrick, you, you've lived it as a. Um, you started your career as a mechanical contractor, yep. uh, and, and now you're involved with, with tens of millions of square foot of, of, of commercial and other sectors of types of property um, that Lincoln Harris serves. So it's, it means a lot to hear from you and your experiences. And, and, and it's not always an easy path, uh, but that's what uh, we're, we're trying to build at Abundant is to make it easier to get to value. Um, so uh, Bethany, um, we're ready for some uh, questions. If there's anybody um, out there that submitted questions, Sure, yeah, we already have a question, but just to let everyone know, if you uh, pop down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A and the chat feature. Feel free to type it in and I'll, I'll read them aloud. We won't be opening up any phone lines. Um, and we did get one question during the presentation and someone was interested in more details regarding the infrastructure required and then of course costs. So if you wanna touch in on any of that. Um, I, I apologize, Bethany, to <laughs> say that one more time. You wanted us to touch on the, uh, the cost and the infrastructure? Please, yep. Yeah, so um, uh, infrastructure-wise is, is we, need a, we need data sources. And so the, 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 the most common data source is a control system. Um, any modern control system is, these days is delivered with, with, with BACnet, um, most, I should say, not any. Um, it's very important for building owners when they're upgrading their control systems to, to, to be aware of the difference between BACnet and LAWN, um, uh, between proprietary and non-proprietary, uh, open and closed. Um, uh, ask hard questions of your contractor or your design engineer to make sure, 
if you're in a land with a, a somewhat open control system. Uh, it's not always black and white. Um, but uh, anything, I mean, not to say it, anything that's Niagara-based, Tritium Niagara-based, and, and that comes on a lot of different brands, um, is really easy to connect to. Um, anything with BACnet, uh, based on BACnet, is typically easy to connect to as well. Um, Cost-wise, what we've seen, I mean, we, we, know, we know what our prices are and what some of our partners are, are charging. Um, just for software, an FDD platform to be deployed, um, you're, you're probably looking in the uh, uh, close to, you know, 10 cents a square foot range. Um, and that's, 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 that's where your team um, is going to be doing the curation, what we call curation. As a managed service, either uh, because it's a service you're building internally to your company as a property manager or a big portfolio owner, or uh, say you're a mechanical service contractor, um, they're starting to build analytic services. Uh, managed service might be a little bit more, but at the end of the day, we've seen platform costs. Uh, once installed, it runs around, say, five cents a square foot a year going forward. So that's the type of of, um, of, uh, of an investment required. Now keep in mind, 20% consumption savings can easily be uh, 30 to 50 cents a square foot a year in energy savings alone. And, and as we articulated, this is a lot more valuable than energy. It's, it's equipment, uh, health, and longevity, as well as uh, comfort for the people in the building. And, and, and those people is what drives the economics of the building. Yeah, that leads to Jay's question, and um, they wanted to know about typical ROIs, which you just touched on, and then also savings that are being passed through um, to the tenants, if you have experience with that. Uh, you know, Patrick, I'll, I'll let you comment a little bit about that, um, kind of lease dependent. Yeah, uh, it does depend on the lease. Um, typical leases, uh, energy will be passed through, so energy consumption will be passed through. Um, like I said, you get into to things with the base year and, and you're charging them for, for what you think energy usage will be and then you have to show up uh, before or after. But, but at the end of the day, typically any tenant in the building is going to be covering their pro rata share of energy usage. So tenants will see the energy savings um, that, that you have in a building. Uh, that gets passed through. Um, ROIs from the system, you know, it, it really depends. Um, like I said, we had a brand new building uh, that we put it in, so it's kind of hard to to determine some of what that ROI is. Uh, we recently put it into a, a, an older operating building, and um, our ROI is, is zero. Um, we're finding more savings every month than what we're paying for the system. So, um, it's immediate. So, you know, over, over the life of the system, um, it can vary. Um, but but kind of going beyond that ROI, and, and this is what I'd like everybody to kind of understand about, especially about these type of systems, is you might find a lot of savings in the first year, first two years, and those savings start to kind of dwindle because you're making the building more efficient, you're getting your, your comfort scores better, all in all, that building is becoming better. But if you just stop, then that building is going to start to slip again. And we see that, you know, month to month, we'll see a piece of equipment that got out of whack somehow, and you got to bring that back in. So if you don't, if you stop looking at it, your power is going to go back up, um, your comfort is going to go down, everything's going to start to slip. So that's why, you know, typically they, they want to recommission buildings every five years. Um, to make sure that you're bringing it back in line. Um, so, you know, ROI is, is important, but I'd also say, you know, at some point you have to look at not so much an ROI, but, but the cost of maintaining a properly operated building. Got another question about um, the BMS analytics. Um, how is that helping with capital budgeting? Oh, well, so, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons we got into analytics. Uh, Shannon touched on it in the introduction, 
is we saw a lot of capital going into buildings without facts, without good facts and data to back up why you would do that. So um, I think I actually got a slide, put one in here. Um, we recently created a, um, I mean, we realized that we're tracking the performance of every piece of equipment in a building. And, you know, perhaps the number one driver of, of CapEx needs is, is the age of the equipment. But, you know, that piece of equipment could conk out at nine years or it could conk out at 19 years. Um, what are some indicators that's likely to correlate with whether it's nine or 19? So we used analytics, and I just put a, a graphic on the screen here, to um, help uh, owners and managers in the capital budgeting process add more color on, on pieces of equipment that uh, are at risk of needing replacement. Um, emergency repairs, you know, Patrick, you were just telling me about an emergency boiler replacement. I mean, that, that, that you know, excuse my language, sucks. Um, it adds, you know, 50% more to the cost. But if, and that's not a building we had anymore. Just to be clear. Um, but being able to get as much information as possible ahead of a failure, uh, whether, whether you go so far as to say we can predict a failure, you know, that's a stretch with most technologies, but we're working on it. But there's awesome data. And so using the data to inform capital decisions makes our clients feel more comfortable about the money that they're budgeting and investing. Um, one more question, um, Patrick, are there tenant expectations that analytics have helped you solved? Uh, yeah, um, you know, and a lot of it kind of goes back to, to comfort. Um, you know, tenants in the lease, um, they, you know, they, they want their building to be at the temperatures that they give. They want them to operate, um, you know, at, at the time periods that they want. Um, and a lot of times in these building, building operators know, you know you have tenants and, and they complain about temperature, they complain about airflow, um, they complain about uh, you know, getting up into lease stuff, they complain about how much it costs, um, what, what, the, what the energy is. So you know, getting into analytics, it's no longer reactive, it's proactive. Um, we, we know um, when we have a problem with, with, with comfort. Um, and we can go in there and solve that problem without them putting in a work order. And to see their faces when you come in and say, hey, we're here, we're gonna look at this unit um, because you know, we, we know you guys are having comfort issues and they haven't even put in that work order yet, their faces just kind of light up and they're like, oh my goodness, yes, this is what's, this is what's going on kind of get a little bit more information from them um, to, to know why uh, the, the problem's happening maybe. But, um, but it's, like I said, it's a proactive thing and, and that makes a big difference with these tenants. And um, we've had tenants that, that have left, uh, we, you know, we manage multiple properties and um, have pulled, pulled people out of one of their other buildings and have put them into this building um, because of this, because of the analytics and, and because of the comfort and, and, you know, having, having that much better of a, of a building where they don't have the nuisance of, of how the buildings operate and not being comfortable. Okay. That's powerful. Uh, Bethany, I think we're, I guess we're at the, at the end here. And a question. Um, and the time, yes. So I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for staying on. Thank you to Abundant Power. We'll be, uh, sharing this uh, video with you all so you can follow up with Abundant Power. Um, but yeah, any final words, Derek? I think we're pretty much uh, good. Yeah, let me, let me pass it to Shannon here. Um, close out, say bye to everyone. We just wanna thank everyone for being on, on here and, and just kind of hearing our vision about why it's time to go beyond energy analytics. We always believe the only way you make buildings better is, is not by looking at energy data, but by turning a wrench, by focusing on the things that matter like workplace experience and asset health. So. I think it's time to go beyond energy and uh, we hope to be hearing from you and talking to you more about this conversation as, as our industry develops. So thank you for attending. Thanks everyone, really appreciate it. Bye-bye.